Good evening and welcome to all of you friends near and far. My name is Christy Franson. I am the chair of the Claremont Mormon Studies Council at Claremont Graduate University in Southern California. Together with the Howard W. Hunter Foundation, we are delighted to bring you another By Study and Faith Fireside. One year ago today, the world as we know it, as we knew it back then, changed dramatically for all of us. As we look back on this anniversary and count up all of the terrible losses, it helps me to also take a moment to acknowledge that there have been some gains as well. One of them for me being these firesides. During the past six months, we have had the opportunity to virtually invite into our homes some truly distinguished Latter-day Saint disciple scholars. Each one of them has shared great knowledge, wisdom, and light on compelling issues in the church and in our world. They have opened our eyes, strengthened our testimonies, and lifted our hearts. And so for that, I give thanks for this past hard year. I have just a very few housekeeping items as we begin. Um, some of you have heard these items several times before, but they're really important. If you've not already done so, please, please, please sign up on our email list so that you will know about future firesides and all the other Mormon studies events that are ongoing. You'll find the link for that in the chat box on our CGU Mormon Studies website or on our Facebook page. And please, we invite you to share this link with your friends and family. Um, if you enjoy this fireside, and we know you will, and you want to support the cause of Global Mormon Studies, we also invite you to make a donation, however large or small. It's very easy to do. Just click on the link found on the email announcement for this fireside or on our CGU website. The Claremont Mormon Studies program is 100% dependent on the donations of wonderful, blessed benefactors just like you, and we thank you. We will start with an invocation by Rosalind Welch, a member of the Mormon Studies Advisory Council. Rosalind is an independent scholar working in Mormon literature, scripture, and theology. She holds a PhD in early, early modern English literature from the University of California at San Diego. She is the author most recently of Ether, a brief theological introduction. Her work has also appeared in the major LDS academic journals. She lives in St. Louis, Missouri with her husband and four children who happen to be my grandchildren because Rosalind is my daughter. <laughs> Um, after the prayer, I will turn the screen over to Professor Matt Bowman, who will introduce our speaker, Rosalind. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful to bow our heads and gather virtually across the miles this evening as daughters and sons in thy kingdom. We're grateful for our sister, Melissa, for her willingness to speak to us tonight, Father, and we ask that Thy spirit will be upon each one of us to open our hearts to her vision and to her gifts. We ask that thou wouldst bless and strengthen her. Um, we're grateful for Matt and Christy and all the others who have worked hard to organize this event for us. Most of all, Father, we thank thee for the gift of thy son and for his love, which is um, the engine of the Zion that we hope to build together. We love thee and we pray for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you to Rosalind and thank you to Christy. I am Matt Bowman. I am the Howard W. Hunter Chair of Mormon Studies at Claremont Graduate University. And this is my wife, Tamara we will be your hosts this evening. Um, it is our honor to introduce Melissa Inouye and then following her talk to 
handle the Q&A. Um, we have disabled the chat. Um, we ask you if you have questions and answers to put those in the Q&A box that you see at the bottom center of your screen. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Melissa Inoue, our speaker this evening. She is a senior lecturer in Asian studies at the University of Auckland, of all places, and historian at the Church History Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She holds a PhD from Harvard University um, and is the author of a couple of books, um, the first being China and the True Jesus, Charisma and Organization in the Chinese Christian Church, which was published by Oxford University Press two years ago. She is also the author of a memoir, Crossings, a bald Asian American Latter-day Saint woman scholar's ventures through life, death, cancer, and motherhood, not necessarily in that order. This was published by Deseret Book and the BYU Maxwell Institute in 2019. It is a lovely, lovely book, and I think it gets most at the things I value about Melissa, which is her ability to bridge heaven and earth, that she finds God in this book in the grubbiness of primary children's figures, in the brokenheartedness of the sick and afflicted, um, I find really moving. She is, I think, a true Matthew, <clears throat> excuse me, a Matthew Latter-day Saint. That is, she sees Christ in all of us. So with that, um, we are going to try an experiment, which is I am going to operate Melissa's slides while she talks. So we will see how this goes. Um, Melissa, let's see if I can share our screen. All right, there we go. Looks great. Well, thanks so much for this kind introduction. Can you hear me, Matt? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. So I'm so pleased to be here. Um, I, I feel like I, I was actually just in Southern California earlier um, this weekend. So I feel like I, I can say it's kind of like being there because I just was there, but also like sadly ironic because, um, you know, I was at the beach and the gulls were crying and the, there was the tide pools and, and now I'm here in a cold place um, and, and on Zoom to bat. So um, being cold and on Zoom is about as far away from a real audience in California as you can get. So I'm really sorry about that. Um, but it's lovely to be here virtually with everyone. So because this is a California fireside, I was sort of thinking autobiographically. And I was thinking, how have, how have my perspectives changed since I was a kid growing up in Southern California in the Costa Mesa First Ward? And I thought I would just share those perspectives today. So since leaving this beautiful, beachy, uh, multicultural, multi-ethnic land of my childhood, I've had some experiences that have um, shaped my assumptions and the way I see things. And these experiences come from uh, my education, from my time serving in the church, uh, time spent parenting, uh, time doing academic research, and also my current work as a historian in the church history department. I work currently on a project called the Global Histories, which are the histories of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in basically every place where we are. They are um, being released as we can get them out. And right now, if you go to the Gospel Library app, they are in the Gospel Library under the Church History section, Global Histories, and more coming every day. So um, of course, in sharing these perspectives, they're not the only perspectives that you can have, um, I'll just share them in case they're useful. And I just realized, Matt, um, I need to tell you when to advance the slides, huh? Because I didn't give you um, my text. Correct. Right? Okay, no problem. <laughs> I'll tell you when, I'll just say, I'll just like make a beep or something like that. Um, so because of my role as an academic and as a church historian, Sometimes people reach out to me with some questions and issues they're struggling with. They use phrases like, my shelf broke and it all came crashing down and I'm overwhelmed and I don't know how to make sense of this. So today's talk is not a talk about responding to crises of faith, but I've observed that people who have crises of faith often express certain assumptions about what the church is, 
or what it should be that are really different from my current view. So first, I used to think that because my church was God's church, we were more correct than anyone else. Our scripture was the most correct, our doctrine was the most correct, our leaders and our way of life were the most correct. Uh, I thought we were just awesome in every single way. Um, and then I learned that we, the Latter-day Saints, are not immune to errors or to bad judgment or social pressures, culture, and sin. So often I learned we make mistakes just like any other group of God's children. We're subject to the pressures of culture and the transformations of time. We have good apples and bad apples. The second thing, the perspective that I used to have that is, is now different for me, I used to think my church was the same wherever one went. Anywhere you went in the world, there on Sunday, you'd find the Latter-day Saints singing the hymns of Zion and partaking of the sacrament. But then as I lived and served in the church in various parts of the world, I came to understand the power of culture to shape our assumptions about what the world is, how we should live in it, who God is, what God wants. I realized that we, the Latter-day Saints, are incredibly different from each other. So both of my childhood views, namely uh, to be a member, the Latter-day Saint is to be a member of the most exemplary, most correct group of people on earth. And number two, to be a Latter-day Saint is to have the same beliefs, the same values and do things the same way I now realize just don't hold up when you look at the big picture. This is partly because the big picture shows how tiny we are. If you counted every single Latter-day Saint on the books, which is more than those Latter-day Saints who are actively participating, we represent 0.02% of the world's population. If every single person is God's beloved child and has been so for all of human history, it seems pretty likely that God has also spoken to others and chosen others to accomplish God's eternal work out there in the 99.98%. The Book of Mormon cautions against this sort of narrow, God has spoken to me, so God can't have spoken to you mindset in 2 Nephi 29.7. Beep for Matt. It says, know you not that there are more nations than one? Know ye not that I, the Lord your God, have created all men and women, and that I remember those who are upon the isles of the sea, and that I rule in the heavens above, and even in the, in, in the earth beneath, and I bring forth my word unto the children of men, yea, even upon all the nations of the earth. Now this section in Nephi is criticizing people who say, a Bible, a Bible, we have a Bible, and we need no more Bible. That is people who said, what we've already got is perfect and complete, and we don't need anything else. But this indeed used to be my view in younger years. I saw that phrase, fullness of the gospel, not as more options, more complexity, more perspectives, but as a sort of exhausting, all-encompassing, we've got it all here. We don't need anything you have, but you certainly need what we have. Beep. The problem with this, we've got it all mindset is that the world is wide. For instance, if we represented the 0.02% of Latter-day Saints currently on the face of the earth, in terms of square mileage, our Latter-day Saint territory would take up the same space as Azerbaijan, Serbia, or greater Los Angeles. Now, I'm speaking to a Los Angeles crowd. There's nothing wrong with living your whole life in Azerbaijan or in Serbia or greater Los Angeles. But there is a lot of other stuff out there in the other 99.98% of the world. So if we're not the best ever and not the same wherever you go, then what do I think we are? Well, this is what I think. My church is real. The Latter-day Saints are true and our shared work of Zion is worthy. Let's talk a little bit about this first idea uh, about our most correctness. When I was growing up here in Southern California, I did kind of think the church was the best sort of human organization, a place where we knew what was right, did what was right, and um, were a kind of a shining city on the hill and, and everyone should be exactly like us. Um, I thought we were a refuge from the world's problems. I thought everyone in my ward was amazing. I felt deeply loved and accepted. Next slide. I was digging around in my old journals and I found these entries uh, from 1997, the year that I graduated from Estancia High School. This was also the year my piano teacher, Sister Bunker, who is also the ward organist, started having me play the organ in church. Now, true to our Latter-day Saint ethic of doing in order to learn, not doing because qualified, she wanted me to learn how to play the organ in church and the members of my ward were my involuntary schoolroom. I, in doing this, I, I'm not a great um, pianist, I, so I was even, even worse organist. I fumbled with my hands and feet. I had to slide my fingers along that slippery 
keyboard, the, the plastic keys were unweighted. So if you just barely touched them, they would go Rah! make these loud shrieking sounds. Um, and then I would try to press on the pedals, but I couldn't really see them. You had to kind of feel them, um, heel, toe, heel, toe. There were a number of more competent organists in the congregation, uh, but in our ward, Sister Bunker, my piano teacher, was the supreme leader of music whose authority was unchallenged. And the sisters and brothers of the Costa Mesa First Ward were long suffering. No one came up to me to tell me I was the worst. I, I, I did get better, a little better over time. Uh, and a few years later, actually, the ward was blessed with a much better teen organist. He was a young man, I'll call him Jeffrey, who, as far as I could tell, had a telepathic connection with the chorister, Sister Betty Christofferson, who was the organist at the time. Uh, he had long arms, long fingers, long legs. His fingers slid beautifully up and down the keys. His legs seemed to move up and down the pedals of their own accord. And together, uh, this organist and chorister like a well-oiled machine. There were no mistakes in Jeffrey's sacrament meetings. But anyway, there are these two journal entries from January 18th and January 19th, 1997. They cover a Saturday when I went to a ward party and ran into my former and current young women leaders, Sister Rusick and Sister Barnhill, and my neighbor, President Poulter. And they also include the next day, a Sunday, when I played the organ in church. Uh, next slide. Tonight I went to a farewell party for the Yoakums at Sister Rusick's home. So we talked, her and me and Sister Barnhill, President Poulter, our neighbor one street over, came up to me and said, I hear you're playing for us tomorrow. As I stood there in a house warm and buzzing with people, old friends who had known each other for years, I realized again what a tremendously important part of my life these people are. These are my people. Sister Bunker, who tells me uh, to wait for the chorister's upbeat as I'm sitting at the organ. Sister Nordstrom, the upbeat chorister. I remember President Poulter coming over to our house for the game when I was a little kid, maybe in second grade. He was our home teacher. From the top of the stairs, I saw him standing in the doorway. I was having a tantrum. I refused to come down. He smiled. That home is my home. These people are my people. Next slide. January 19th, 1997, Sunday. I played in church today, made lots of mistakes. Press the wrong stop preset for, because I have been given much. As a teenager, I experienced the church as a refuge. For me, it was a safe house in which to grow up, to make mistakes, a cocoon within which people loved me and accepted me no matter what. But as a young adult, I began to observe the church and the world more widely. And I found out that the church wasn't a place of refuge for everyone. Ultimately, it wasn't a place of refuge for Jeffrey, the amazing teen wonder organist who was gay, who felt he had to conceal his sexual orientation at church. It wasn't a safe place for my friends who are black, whose Sunday school teachers told them that because of the amount of melanin they had in their skin, they were cursed whose fellow saints called them foul words at church activities and whose fellow saints stood by saying nothing while racial slurs were used at church activities. It wasn't a place of refuge for hundreds of children and women who were sexually abused by men called to positions of authority and stewardship within my church. Now, I'm not saying that suddenly I discovered the Latter-day Saints were all a bunch of monsters. I'm not trying to accuse you and excuse me. What I'm saying is that over time, I realized that sometimes we, the Latter-day Saints, made mistakes that were much, much worse than stray shrieks on the organ. This became clear when I looked at our history. For example, over a century, for over a century, many Latter-day Saints, including leaders, could not imagine a church where Black Latter-day Saints served on equal footing with all others. They came up with many wild speculations, now all completely disavowed by the church to justify their views. Next slide. I was troubled to learn of times in the past and in the present when, as Elder Uchtdorf had said, Latter-day Saints made mistakes. I thought, if God is leading us, how can we make mistakes? If Jesus is here among us, how can he allow us to inflict such harm on his sheep? I felt like my testimony was a bit like that game with wooden blocks, Jenga, where you build a tower of blocks all stacked on one another. You take turns taking the blocks out one by one and it becomes more and more precarious. Over time, however, I began to see maybe my building block paradigm was wrong. The church wasn't a single uniform structure because it wasn't a thing, it was people. Building metaphors like a keystone of our religion or a shelf or something that comes crashing down are evocative. And um, I use metaphors more than anyone. so. I'm not trying to uh, ruin these metaphors that are out there, 
But one thing in which these particular metaphors are, one way in which these particular metaphors are limited is in their ability to describe the dynamic living elements of our religious movement. When we talk about the church, we're not really describing brick and mortar, but a network of living beings with agency who interact with their environment and with each other over a long period of time. As a historian, I've learned there's a certain liability in large scale human endeavors. The bigger the institution, the more humanity you aim to encompass. And the more humanity you encompass, the better and the worse you become all at the same time. Looking at the church as an institution, it's big. There's a lot of bureaucracy there. There's a lot of human error. There's a lot of culture that we pick up wherever in the world we go. This helps me to understand what President Nelson was asking us to do in last October's General Conference when he called on us, the Latter-day Saints, to lead out in abandoning attitudes and actions of prejudice and to promote respect for all of God's children. It also helps me understand President Oaks's call to the saints to root out racism. These calls to repentance blow my old paradigm out of the water. Of course, we aren't perfect. The prophet wouldn't have to tell us to abandon attitudes and actions of prejudice if they weren't currently endemic within the church. So instead of being a refuge from human problems, I've come to see my church as a sort of central problem hub connecting to all the afflictions of humanity. Do we, the Latter-day Saints, have problems with sexism, racism, and nationalism? Absolutely. Do we, the Latter-day Saints, have diabetes, cancer, malaria, and AIDS? Absolutely. Do we, the Latter-day Saints, find in our own ranks the problems of poverty and malnutrition, of materialism and greed? Yes, we do. Now, this might sound very grim to you, but over time, it started to seem better and better to me. I don't think the purpose of life is to live problem-free. I think the purpose of life is to learn to love as God loves and see as God sees. Next slide. According to 1 John 4.20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother and sister also. Now, even though most of us haven't seen God from a certain point of view, it's quite easy for us to love God. God is all knowing, all powerful. God embodies all virtue, all goodness. We hope God can fix our lives. We go, hope God can heal our, ail our ailments. We know that God loves us unconditionally, etc. By contrast, humans are flawed, weak, easily deceived, easily baited into posting horrible comments on the internet. It's quite easy for us to hate people. So what kind of love is God's kind of love for us? Is it a kind of odd gratitude and admiration for all powerful, all knowing, perfect beings? Or is it a gritty, resilient commitment to and care for flawed and fallible individuals? I think the answer is pretty clear. So to implement godly virtues then is to spend less time admiring God and more time dealing with annoying people. Next slide. So in a sense, when God commands, anyone who loves me must also love their brother and sister, it reminds me of a parent saying, anyone who wants a popsicle has to eat all their broccoli and kale as well. Like eating broccoli and kale, which can be tough and bitter because they're packed with fiber and nutrients, loving fellow beings who are flawed and fallible is healthy for our spiritual development. So if God wants us to learn to love the people we see around us, we need to find ways to see a lot of people. And if there's any one thing one can say about Latter-day Saints is that they see each other a lot. At worship, at play, on missions, during conference, in temples, at Zoom devotionals. What better way to live in relationship with those brothers and sisters Christ acknowledges, acknowledge could be really difficult to love? What better venue for seeing and connecting with our fellow beings, for coming to understand how their needs differ from our own? So my church is not problem free. It is problem full in the sense that all the problems of humanity can be found here in our tiny 0.02% scale microcosm. But if life is not about avoiding problems, but instead learning how to identify them and respond to them creatively and resiliently, what better place to do it than here among many sisters and brothers I would not otherwise see. The second thing I used to think about the church is that it was the same everywhere you went. 
I assume the cultural forms of which I grew up with a norm all around the world. Having spent 18 years in the Costa Mesa First Ward, I could read our collective actions like a book. I could predict the number of seconds until a wailing child was carried out of the chapel over their parents' shoulder, the sound trailing off like a departing ambulance. I could tell just from the tone and cadence of a speaker's voice that they were two sentences away from a concluding paragraph. And that concluding paragraph would be about three to four sentences of testimony. I knew well the chain reaction of chair folding at the end of an activity and how many people and empty seats it would take to set off that chain reaction. I remember being touched as a young person to encounter the church in different places and to think that despite many differences, we all believe the same things. As a 16 year old exchange student in Nuremberg, Germany, I found my way to the local Latter-day Saint ward. There were the English speaking American missionaries, the German speaking local members, the familiar hymns played on the organ by a talented musician and led by a chorister. As a university student studying abroad in Beijing, I found a small group of expatriates who met in a room in the Kunlun Hotel. Local members invited us students into their homes for lunch after church. When passing through Mongolia, also as a college student, I boarded with a local member family. In all these places, I met people from many walks of life, all coming together to sing the hymns of Zion, to pray, to nourish each other physically and spiritually. Next slide. Then I began to study language and culture more deeply and to learn how people's fundamental assumptions about everything could be so different. I served a mission in Taiwan and later began a PhD program at Harvard in East Asian languages and civilizations. I learned that in Chinese, there is no male or female pronoun for God. They never call God or heavenly father, he. There's a godly pronoun for God, which sounds the same as the pronoun for males and the same as a pronoun for females, ta. It's just written differently. And here you can see the different ta's. So um, I delved into Buddhist and Confucian and Taoist texts and found completely different assumptions about the nature of reality and the nature of humanity. Even a question like, what is the purpose of life? didn't really make sense in certain cultural contexts. When I took a position at the University of Auckland, I encountered Maori culture. I horrified my students uh, when early on in my teaching there, I suggested that they sit on the tables in our lecture hall in the Maori studies building. In a Maori cultural context, sitting on a table is one of the worst things you can do. I in turn was horrified to think that I could commit a rude, dishonorable deed without even knowing it. Culture's a minefield. The invisible signs we make to each other, the honor we give or destroy by the order in which we do things, the key words, the phrases that signal certain group alliances, how complex, how tricky it all is. Serving in the church as my family moved around from the US to China to Hong Kong to New Zealand, I noticed the role that local culture played in what people liked most and least about the church. In my Mandarin speaking branch in Hong Kong, the church ward members idealized family structure and discipline. Most of the members in my Relief Society knew the names of the prophet, maybe one or two apostles, but the rest of the names were hard to remember. And the centralized general conference church wasn't a big component of their religious life. We'd probably like watch one hour on Sunday morning, you know, one session. Uh, in Utah, by contrast, I was in wards where people named their kids McKay, Dallin, and Oaks, uh, and where general conference was an all weekend long marathon. In Auckland, people didn't really care about the problems in church history that troubled many Americans, like polygamy or all the crazy stuff Brigham Young said. Their eyes glazed over when there were stories of persecution in this or that Midwestern American rural county. There's like Clay County, it's like Jackson County, there's all these counties. Now, what they cared about was the history of the church when it started in New Zealand, how the Book of Mormon was translated, for instance. What bugged them was the era in church history when Maori language and funeral customs were banned from Latter-day Saint settings. In feminist friendly New Zealand, most of the women were proud working mums. What caused friction between women in the ward was not the issue of who worked and who stayed at home, but the issue of who brought the food to the ward parties and who whipped out containers, packed the food up and took it off to their cars at ward parties. In India, as I learned from the research of my colleague, Tanalyn Rutherford, Members work hard to make the church a casteless space. Members of the lowest castes are called to be, in, to be state presidents. Members of the Brahmin castes make sure they are the ones cleaning the toilets at the ward chapel cleaning each week. And yet caste remains a factor in marriage arrangements. And although North American leaders prescribe the usual regimen of dating than marriage, 
For many Latter-day Saints, this seems morally unacceptable. They arrange temple marriages for their children. Next slide. Here at the Church History Department, as I work on the global histories, the stories of the Latter-day Saints in every part of the world where the church has been established, I learn more about distinctive local Latter-day Saint cultures. For instance, the Vienna branch in Austria had a long tradition of music and theater. The branch had its own orchestra and members often put on plays for board activities. In 1958, architect and new convert Johann Wundra was called to, actually would be Wundra, was called to head up the branch's theater group. It quickly became a mission-wide group serving all of Austria's branches, a sort of high-class roadshow on steroids. The group produced classic plays that raised spiritual questions like Goethe's Faust. They also produced an original play called Paul in Ephesus, written by a brother Mühlbacher from the Salzburg branch. Next slide. Diversity unfolds not only on a national scale, but within every ward and branch. In the St. Georg branch in Hamburg, Germany during World War II, Branch president Arthur Zander was an outspoken supporter of the Nazi party. Some members of the branch were members of the armed services and the police who came to church in their uniforms. Others just went with the flow, emphasizing the 12th article of faith about submitting to governmental authority. Still others hated the Nazis and tried to resist just by being slow to follow. And some like Helmut Hubener and his two friends in the Young Men program actively fought against the Nazis. They used the church's typewriter to create anti-Nazi leaflets. Helmuth was caught and became the youngest person at age 17 to be executed by the Nazi High Tribunal. His two friends, Karl Heinz Schniebe and Rudi Wobbe, served several years in prison. So just within that one branch, you had Nazi Latter-day Saints and anti-Nazi Latter-day Saints and everything in between. Even aspects of Latter-day Saint life that many might feel are standard practice may vary. In some villages in Papua New Guinea, Latter-day Saints use bits of banana for the body of Christ. In Hong Kong, Filipina and Indonesian dom domestic worker branches are staffed by female ward mission leaders, female Sunday school presidents, female ward clerks. Depending on where you are in the world, your Sabbath day may be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. Thus, no one can say definitively who the Latter-day Saints are, what they do, and what they stand for all around the world. How wide are the distances between us? We can all recite the articles of faith, but what about when someone in a given place perceives tension between obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law and being honest, true, chaste, benevolent, virtuous, and doing good to all? We can all read the gospels where Jesus says to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But so often when someone says, you're not treating me right, we say, that's because you don't understand what's really good for you, but I do. We can all sing, now let us rejoice in the day of salvation. No longer as strangers on earth need we roam. But so often we cannot bear to spend even 10 minutes hearing the political views or emotional pain of a fellow Latter-day Saint who seems alien to us. With such different understandings of how the gospel of Jesus Christ should unfold in everyday life in a local, political, and cultural context, what holds us together? Although we may have different understandings and hopes for the various liturgies, ordinances, manuals, and lessons we share, what holds us together, I think, is a dual vertical and horizontal orientation in our shared covenants. By vertical, I mean to God. By horizontal, I mean to each other. The baptismal covenant in Mosiah 318 is not only to take Christ's name upon us, but also to be one people, to bear one another's burdens and mourn with those that mourn. The temple covenants are not only to obey God and keep God's commandments, but also to consecrate our time and our talents to building Zion on the face of the earth. We may not understand each other, but we are fundamentally oriented toward each other as we seek God, not just turning our faces up to the heavens, but also looking out towards each other to see each other. This horizontal orientation finds expression not only in our theology, but also in our organization at the grassroots in the people-to-people -people networks and connections cultivated not only locally, but all over the world. So in sum, I don't see the ch church as a place of all-encompassing correctness, and I don't see my church as a place that's the same everywhere you go. We are both too small and too big for correctness and homogeneity. So what is my church to me? Well, my church is, uh, to describe this, I will turn to four letter words. Next slide. 
My church is real. The Latter-day Saints are true and our shared work of Zion is worthy. To me, the church is real. This is a big deal. You may say literally everything in the world is real from the gum on the bottom of my shoe to the planet Mars. And this is correct. But I'm someone who spent a lot of time studying moral ideological movements, mostly in China, but also in the US and Europe and Japan. Everyone is always trying to spearhead the triumph of good over evil. Everyone wants to design a new good society where the wrong fails and the right prevails. And yet the bigger and grander this vision, the worse things usually work out in their implementation. It's one thing to say things in the right way with exacting precision, but it's another thing, a harder thing, and I think a more godly thing to be good and loving to those who are hard to love. Cultivating Christ-like virtues is not a theoretical project. The only thing that works is practice. The church is a real place to do real work on being real children of God. Next slide. You can also see the church as a sandbox in two sentences, two sentences. First is a place for interactive play, a place where we learn how to share. Uh, if you remember your childhood days in sandboxes, you know, everyone's happily digging, tunneling, building sandcastles, and uh, there's a lot of interaction and buzz in a sandbox. But as anyone who can remember their childhood sandboxes also knows, the sandbox is one of the unhappiest places on the playground because sand hurts when it gets in people's eyes. When people throw sand, kick sand, knock down walls, collapse tunnels, uh, people get hurt and uh, it becomes a source of frustration and sadness. Second, next slide. It, the church is a sandbox in that it's a place of these persistent frustrations that not only train us, but change us. It's perhaps like a rock tumbler, which is a container for accelerating the natural process of things um, wearing down and becoming smooth over time. So river rocks, for instance, become kind of smooth pebbles because they're always being you know, polished and, and slowly kind of eroded over time. But if you want to accelerate that process and get rocks that, that would not normally uh, become smooth, to become smooth, you put them in a rock tumbler, you put them in the container with the other rocks, you add sand or some other kind of grit, that's essential, the grit. And then you turn the machine on and it slowly turns and tumbles the rocks so they bump against each other and polish each other. Bits break off from one rock and become grit that helps to polish others. And, through this process, um, these beautiful striations from within all of the rocks begin to emerge and they, they begin to shine. Now, such a sandbox is the worst possible place to be a single issue voter. It is an uncomfortable place for someone who's devoted to a single political party's platform. It's a nightmare for someone who champions a single high-minded cause. And it's a painful place to fight for justice for a single marginalized group. I point this out not because I'm trying to discourage us from being uh, discourage us from being engaged citizens or passionate activists or people who fight for justice and reach out to the marginalized. What I'm trying to say is in our giant worldwide sandbox, when we're all in it together, all of our actions tend to kind of bump up against each other. I wouldn't say our actions collectively cancel each other out. But we, the Latter-day Saints, are so diverse and the law of agency so often mirrors the law of entropy. Even when we are trying to act together, we often get in each other's way. This can be very frustrating when one is trying to make progress on one thing in one direction, only to find oneself stymied by Latter-day Saints trying to make progress on this same thing in the other direction. Next slide. It helps me to think that the purpose of life is not to achieve any single ism for these isms vary with nations, counties, and neighborhoods. The purpose of life, I believe, is to assist the Lord of the vineyard, to help the children of God flourish wherever they are planted. It's interesting to me that in this allegory of the vineyard in Jacob 5, uh, he goes beyond the image of God's children as plants. We are both the trees, but also the workers. What is important perhaps is not the particular ism for which we're working, but the effort we're putting forth on others' behalf. 
Not only have I found the church to be real, a sandbox where real work, play, and change takes place, I have also found the Latter-day Saints to be true. In April 2017, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. I had surgery to remove the tumor in June. During the weeks of recovering from the surgery, I remained home by myself in New Zealand while my husband and children went to the United States to visit our family. My only companion was Birdie, my cancer dog. I got him about a week after my diagnosis. And this was in the Southern Hemisphere fall, and it was dark early and cold at night. One night I was sitting in my kitchen when a sister from Relief Society, Sister Aparamo, knocked on the door. Uh, she's a Samoan woman. She stepped into my kitchen with a bunch of flowers. Her face with its wrinkles and sags and her voice worn down with use reminded me of my Chinese grandmother. She chatted genially about the new investigator from Brazil and her granddaughter who's on a mission in Australia. She was one of the people in the ward who regularly fed the missionaries. So she was up, always up to date on the latest missionary gossip. She told me that the elders had recently had to say a blessing over their house because it was haunted and it was giving them a lot of trouble. But she said, they've just got to be brave. I thanked her for the time she had spent with my two younger children when she was their primary teacher. She replied that in truth, she had been getting tired of primary, but felt that it was important for the kids to have a teacher who showed up. She gave me her phone number and told me to text her anytime. As her visit seemed to be coming to a close, I thanked her and gave her a hug. Then surprising me, she asked, can I leave you with a prayer? Sure, thank you, I said, sitting down again. For some reason, I didn't close my eyes all the way, but stared down at the floor. At that time, I felt as if I were an observer. At that time of anxiety and pain, I didn't really know what to expect from prayers. I was afraid that beyond thy will be done, there was nothing to say. Sister Aparamo said, bless Melissa so she can live to take care of her kids. With great eloquence, she invoked blessings upon my body, my spirit, the house, my children and husband far away. The specific words escaped me, but I remember a feeling of deep, settling calm. I felt as if I could feel my blood vessels widening and my lungs expanding. This is what the presence of the Holy Spirit feels like to me. Sister Aparamo hadn't laid her hands on my head and she hadn't invoked the Melchizedek priesthood, but she had indeed blessed me as did our Mormon foremothers in the 19th and early 20th centuries. At this lonely juncture in my life, I received a blessing from a woman of another generation from another country who but for the church would never have come into my life to teach my children and minister to me. Her prayer said what I had been afraid to say and asked what I had been afraid to ask. It's frightening to face a life-threatening illness and wonder whether God intends for you to make it to the other side. You feel foolish pleading for your life because it's quite possible that God has already seen that this will go nowhere. But if someone else makes this plea on your behalf, you feel not presumptuous, but grateful and receiving. Through Sister Aparamo, I felt God's power and care in my mind, my heart, and my body. Sometimes we need others to plead with us and on our behalf before God. This is not because God responds to popularity contests, but sometimes we on our own are just not up to the task. My church has many organizational structures, some of which are teeth gnashingly bureaucratic and subject to all sorts of system systemic problems are nevertheless deliberately designed to facilitate this sort of transformative human interaction, interaction and intercession. Visiting and teaching and ministering, serving in callings, passing the sacrament between rows and from hand to hand, reaching out to the community, fasting together, seeking out our ancestors and standing in their places. Here in the spaces between us spring up fountains of living water. We Latter-day Saints all over the world who labor to build Zion are ordinary people with obvious shortcomings. We regularly fail to live up to the measure of our divine callings. It is genuinely painful to encounter unchristlike behavior not only in the world, but also within one's own church and history. But since I myself am a regular source of unchristlike errors, this pain is something I must own. I must take responsibility for what needs fixing and put my shoulder to the wheel. Just like volunteering to physically clean the chapel, there are many ways to contribute intellect and effort to repair and renew the living structures of the church. If our heavenly parents had intended for everyone to think alike and follow the same path back to them, 
It was in their power to give everyone the same life experiences and make one true path unmistakably clear. Yet God's children are not all alike, and we disagree deeply about what is good and true. The church is not a solution for the problem of diversity, but a preserve within which to practice diversity's virtues. In this, our teacher is the holy one who befriended oppressive tax collectors, brazen prostitutes, infectious lepers, and taught people in their own lands and languages and amidst their own sets of cultural difficulties and problems. His was always the path of most resistance. This path of most resistance is the path to becoming as God now is. I don't think it's a path in the sense of being an infinite line ascending through eternity, leaving behind one problem after another as one achieves milestone after divine milestone. I think it's a winding narrow path that circles infinitely back on itself and over and over again in a crowded orchard, helping the Lord of the vineyard to tend the trees, shoveling manure, digging holes, climbing high to check the branches, climbing low to check the roots seeking the faces of our heavenly father and mother as they run to and fro, showing us how to be one family, to covenant with another as well, one another as well as with them, to become as they are through the atonement of Christ is the work of Zion, a task that amidst all the Christianities and all the beautiful religious traditions with which God has blessed the people of the earth is so defined within my church alone. Please join with me in the work of Zion, which is not the work of building new walls and turrets of empire, but the work of helping all God's children to flourish in their vineyard. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, amen, Melissa. Thank you.